everyone. So I'm Bill Wilson. I'm the executive director at CNS. And I want to welcome you to uh, Dr. Zingavel's uh, seminar today. Um, I was going through kind of the literature like I do. I, I go through the literature two days a week, right? Just read random stuff. And I paper pops up that they've now made a 40 nanometer transistor out of carbon nanotubes at IBM. And I'm like, well, didn't IBM like shut down carbon nanotube everything a year ago? Right? So my solution to that problem is to find out what's going on at IBM. I can either call Zing and pump him for information, or I can simply invite him to give a talk, you know, give his information more easily. <laughs> so Zing, like every great electrical engineer, was initially trained as a chemist. I uh, got his bachelor's degree in chemistry at Nanjing University in China, and then did graduate work in material science at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, another institution close to my heart in John Rogers' group working on carbon nanotubes. Uh, from there, in 2009, he went to IBM, of course, to escape carbon nanotube work, because everybody knows carbon nanotube work is dying, to work on solar cells at IBM. Did that for a few years. Now, of course, he's back in the nanoscale electronics department, again, working on carbon nanotubes. Everybody's fair-haired stepchild of a nanomaterial. And so today, he's going to talk to us about uh, the work that they're doing at IBM uh, developing very, very small scale nanotube electronics. And uh, I hope he gives us a vision of where nanotube based VLSI may eventually go. And so, Dr. Scott. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> and thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so, again, my name is uh, Ching Chao. <laughs> I came from uh, IBM T.J. Watson Research Center. So this uh, beautiful lab designed by Aero Theronin is located about 40 miles north of Manhattan. So it is a headquarter of IBM Research, the largest industrial research organization on the planet. Uh, as the birthplace of a DRAM, you know, copper interconnect technology, recording head for magnetic disks, and even laser eye surgery is also a historical site designated by both APS and IEEE. So today I will give you a progress report about our recent efforts at IBM Watson Lab on developing carbon nanotube transistor technology for extremely scaled logic devices, which I think is still very exciting. Uh, I will first show you like, why we want to do it from an industrial perspective, uh, and then how our recent results prove this idea is not only you know, physically plausible, but also technically feasible. And finally, I will share with you some of my personal perspectives uh, on the future of this nanotube technology. So this is how Albert Einstein presented his research in 1934. He used a blackboard rather than a computer connected to a projector. And that's because this is what graphic computers looked like in 1956, one year after his death. The stage computer weighed over 250 tons and consumed one megawatt with the grand mission of alerting the United States for Russia attacks, rather than a personal tool for scientists. But after only 60 years, nowadays, the computer within your smartphone is powered by over 3 billion transistors and consume at most a few watts. And the fundamental driving force for this dramatic change is the invention of the integrated circuit, followed by the adoption of Moore's law by the semiconductor industry, which says, we will double the number of transistors in our microprocessors every two years by making everything smaller in order to survive in this crazy industry. And by making things smaller, we also make them switch at a faster speed and consume less power. And amazingly, as an industry, we have been doing this successfully for over 50 years, which represents one of the most amazing evolutionary technological progress in human history. As stated by Golden Moore himself, after 50 years, if the auto industry advanced as rapidly as the semiconductor industry, a Rolls Royce would get half a million miles per gallon, and it would be cheaper to throw it away than to park it. I guess it's especially true in places like Boston, right? Uh, and because of the success of Moore's law, we have created a tremendous, of, a tremendous amount of wealth and continued the prosperity for our society. We have even come to expect such exponentially more powerful and cheaper computing is going to continue forever. 
We build our whole economy based on this idea, even bet our future. And here are some examples. Right? Artificial intelligence, you know, this lovely Watson computer could play Jeopardy. However, based on current hardware, it occupies a room and costs over three million dollars. Blockchain, a cool idea to, to share hundreds of thousands of ledgers across the network and continuously update them for ultimate security. But based on current hardware, you need to build a mining farm in Iceland in order to get Bitcoins, or oh, IBM System Z, the largest commercial mainframe with specially designed hardware accelerators to run blockchain for business. Virtual reality, cool technology. But even for such rudimentary game, you already need state-of-the-art GPU. And for constructing and rendering of environment in real time, future immersive augmented reality, you probably need a computer like this that will be difficult to fit into that small living room, even if you could afford it based on the current hardware. So here you can say, for all these exciting and futuristic things, their common feature is demanding much more powerful and cheaper computational power to make their application impact our society in a large way. However, the party is winding down after 50 years. Now extending Moore's law has become more and more difficult. And actually, the clock frequency of our microprocessors has already stopped to improve since about 10 years ago, which means the CPUs we are using today is not that faster compared to the ones we used about 10 years ago in performing non-parallel calculations. So what are the major challenge for further device scaling from technology point of view? And what we could do to keep the party going? Well, the first showstopper is the ever-increasing parasitic contact resistance. So this is the structure of a transistor, the basic processing elements within our microprocessor. It has a source and a drain electrode contacting with the semiconductor channel with the gate electrode in between to turn the device on and off. So the overall device footprint is then determined by the combination of its components, mainly the device gate length and the contact length. And the overall device resistance is also determined by the combination of the channel resistance and the contact resistance, which blocks the injection connection of carriers across this semiconductor metal interface. And the reduction of the device gate length decreases the channel resistance, which is good. However, the reduction of this contact length leads to sharply increasing parasitic contact resistance, which can be understood based on standard transmission line model. And these two opposite trends make this contact resistance actually dominant the performance of extremely scaled transistors. And therefore, this kind of universal correlation between contact resistance and contact lens uh, has become a significant obstacle for current device miniaturization. And no solution is known for silicon transistors at five nanometer technology node or beyond, where this contact lens is expected to be smaller than 12 nanometer. So what we can do to overcome this limitation? Well, in principle, you can increase the bonding strength between your semiconductor and metal to reduce this uh, uh, metal semiconductor coupling length, lambda m, as a potential solution to this problem, as basically the, high, the stronger bonding could allow higher transmission probability over a relatively short, air, short, short distance. So following this guideline, an interesting observation is compared to metal steady side, which is metal contact to silicon, the bonding is so much stronger in the refractory metal carbide. So is it possible that we can overcome this uh, contact lens scaling problem by making a novel device with a carbon-based semiconductor channel, like carbon nanotube, connecting with uh, a carbide-forming metal such as molybdenum? And we were very fascinated by this idea as it could be an ultimate solution to this problem. If the coupling between moly and carbon is strong enough, we can then score a low contact resistance that is totally independent of contact length, as in this geometry, 
all the carriers come from your nanotube channel and either be reflect, uh, either be collected into the metal contact or get reflected back right at this zero dimensional interface. Then the first question is, you know, can we make this structure an experiment? Well, the possibility to form this uh, unbounded contact structure where the open end of the nanotube is directly connected with moly through strongly coupled carbide bond is firstly supported by in situ XRD. It confirms this carbide formation reaction between bulk quantities of carbon nanotubes with deposited moly on top at an elevated temperature above 800 degrees Celsius with the emergence of metal carbide peaks. And Rama and ADX further confirms the reaction between more device relevant monolayer of nanotubes with eight nanometer of moly deposited on top. So with the moly cap, the Raman characteristic of nanotube disappear at 850 degrees Celsius, a phenomenon not observed in the control sample. And ADX of the, of the same device uh, shows the carbon atom actually diffuse out from this nanotube monolayer to the whole moly electrode after kneading, also suggesting the formation of the desired unbounded contact structure at the interface. Then the next question is how about their electrical properties? Well, first, this unbounded contact to nanotubes are ohmic with their device output resistance independent of temperature down to 20K. This result shows there's no uh, uh, shocky barrier at, at the interface because the conduction is not limited by semionic emission. And, and second, we make a race of transistors with their contact length varied all the way from 300 nanometer to merely 10 nanometer on the same nanotube. And we find with this unbounded contact, the contact resistance is indeed not only small at about 30 kilo ohm per tube, but also independent of the contact length as expected. And more importantly, compared to the best conventional or side bounded contact where palladium is deposited on top of the nanotube and coupled with the channel through weak one volt interaction, then at the same 10 nanometer contact length, the contact resistance for this unbounded contact is at least two times smaller to satisfy the target specified in the international technology roadmap for semiconductors. But more importantly, it is, it is this one is scalable to even smaller dimensions as an ultimate solution to this problem. So beside contact, what are the other factors limiting silicon transistor scaling? The second critical one is the power constraint. So when you pack more and more transistors in the same area, the power consumption power consumption of each individual device has to be dramatically reduced to maintain the chip power density, which is already approaching that of a nuclear reactor at above 100 watts per centimeter square. And to understand the conventional solution to this problem and why it fails right now, we first need to understand how transistors operate. Under their standard or bias condition, a dry voltage VDD is applied on the drain electrode the source electrode is grounded, and by changing the voltage applied on the gate electrode from zero volts to VDD, you can turn the device from off state where there's very small current flow to on state where there's high current passing the threshold voltage uh, VT point in the middle. And the slope of this transition is limited to be above 60 millivolts per decade by thermodynamics. So when you go to smaller dimensions, you can then concurrently reduce the drive voltage VDD and threshold voltage VT. And by doing that, you can keep this device on state current as a constant for better performance, but at the same time, reduce the on state power consumption with the price of higher off state leakage current or the, pass or, the, or the passive power consumption of your transistor. And at the very beginning, this offset leakage current is very small, so a little bit of increase is not a big deal. However, after 50 years, this offset leakage current cannot be increased any further as this passive power consumption or the standby power 
of our microprocessors has already dominated in current technologies. So what we could do to overcome these limitations? Well, ideally, we want to keep the VT as a constant so that the offset leakage current will not increase any further. At the same time, we want to keep the device onset current unchanged to make sure device scaling still leads to performance improvement, but only reduce drive voltage VDD to save power. So it means we need to find a new and better semiconductor material where carriers can travel faster under the same bias condition. And carbon nanotubes, with their high optical phonon energy resulting from strongly one-dimensional confined nanostructure, is again one of the best candidates with their saturation velocity about five times higher than that of silicon and also much higher than that of 3.5 semiconductors. We talk about uh, saturation velocity because here our target is extremely scaled transistors where your channel is quasi-ballistic. So we care more about saturation velocity rather than just the carrier mobility. But then the question is, does this attribute really matter for the performance of targeted extremely small transistors? And to vigorously answer this question, we took the challenge of constructing an extremely scaled nanotube transistor in experiment to a footprint of only 40 nanometer. And that 40 nanometer, that 40 nanometer include everything, the contacts, the gate, and spacer. And it's a very aggressive target. It's a size more slow going to reach after another 10 years, and it's beyond the capability of current lithography methods. So in our process flow, we first delimit the overall footprint of our device to 40 nanometer by making an offset trench. And then we pattern the source and drain contact to a 10 nanometer contact length at the bottom of the trench and then react them with carbon nanotubes to form this low resistance and boundary contact. And here cobalt is added to the molefilm as catalyst to greatly reduce the reaction temperature down to 650 degrees Celsius. And such dramatically reduce the processing temperature is critical to maintain this 20 nanometer gap between these electrodes. Then five nanometer aluminum oxide is deposited by atomic layer deposition when as high K gate dielectrics is played in metal gate. So the completed device has this 40 nanometer footprint as designed with about 10 nanometer er, gate length with 10 nanometer contact and five nanometer spacer on each side. It is the smallest complete transistor ever demonstrated and meets the industry target for device scaling after at least another decade. Then the question is, how about their electrical properties? So compared to the most advanced silicon transistor with the same 10 nanometer gate length and under the same drive voltage of 0.5 volts with the same off-state leakage current to make the comparison meaningful, you can see the nanotube transistor demonstrates way much higher uh, pitch normalized on-state current density, which means the nanotube transistor has the capability to deliver the, the much higher performance under the same power consumption or use much lower power for the same performance as a potential solution to the energy crisis in device scaling. So we have talked about the contact and the energy. Uh, finally, let's discuss the short channel effect, which according to its name is directly related with smaller transistors. And when you reduce the device dimension, the current through the leakage pathway far away from your gate electrode becomes a significant problem uh, as the electrostatic impact from your drain bias become important in this area compared to the gate electric field. And then as a result, your gate loses control over the channel and then the transition between the on and off states become less abrupt again leading to higher off-state leakage currents. So as a solution, the industry in the past few years has moved to this new ultra-thin channel device structure. For example, this uh, uh, ETSOI, or extremely thin body silicon insulator, to kind of physically eliminate uh, the presence of these pathways. Or even more advanced 3D structure, like thin fat or nanoware transistors, 
where in addition, your gate electric field can come from different directions to enhance the electrostatic coupling with the channel. But in order to avoid this short channel effect, the silicon film thickness has to be less than roughly half of the device gate length. So at five nanometer technology node, where your gate length is only 10 nanometer, it means the silicon film thickness or the thin width or your nanowire diameter has to be less than five nanometer. And it gives rise to two fundamental problems. The first one is quantum confinement. So at such extremely small dimension, your device silicon channel actually becomes a quantum box. And we all know from uh, basic quantum mechanics, the energy level of a quantum box is a function of its size. And that's exactly what's gonna happen over here. The band gap, one of the most important parameters for a semiconductor, is gonna become a sensitive function to your device dimension. And the device threshold voltage is partially determined by the band gap. So a little change in your device dimension, for example, the thin width due to process variation is gonna create very large threshold voltage variability, a big problem for integrated circuits where we want billions of transistors to turn on at the same voltage. And the situation is even worse for 3.5 semiconductors. Another problem is transport. The reduction of the silicon film thickness sharply reducing the carrier mobility due to enhanced surface roughness scattering. And the best material to solve this problem is, again, carbon nanotubes. They have not only exceptional electrical properties as what we just described, but also this atomically smooth intrinsic ultrasound body of only 1.2 nanometer. And such ultrasound body could offer excellent electrostatic even for extremely skilled transistors as what we demonstrated in experiment. So first, compelled to state-of-the-art silicon transistors at 10 to 14 nanometer technology node, whose overall device footprint is at least two times larger, our 40 nanometer footprint nanotube transistor with 10 nanometer gate length demonstrate similar sub-threshold swing, and together with about two times higher uh, uh, on-current density under a lower soft swing bias of 0.5 volts, and then compared with uh, the silicon thin set with uh, the same 10 nanometer gate length, our nanotube transistor indeed show much lower sub-threshold swing at about 85 millivolts per decade compared to 125 millivolts per decade for silicon devices. And this results clearly show the scaling advantage of our nanotube transistors resulting from their intrinsic ultrasound body, an important observation in this work. So as a summary, you know, many people talk about replacing silicon with nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes for their high carrier mobility. Mm. But such argument does not address what really matters for device scaling. From industry perspective, what's really unique about carbon nanotubes are their intrinsic ultrasound body, high saturation velocity resulting from their quantum confinement and also their capability to form this low resistance size independent and body contact. And we have proved in experiment all these attributes really matter for the performance of extremely scaled transistors. However, uh, oh, sorry, just another thing. Uh, so if we, if we can replace uh, uh, silicon with nanotube transistors in the design of our IBM Power 7 microprocessor, we found we can get about two to three times better performance together with more than two-fold reduction in energy consumption. So that's a, that's a paradigm shift compared to conventional silicon scaling whose improvement is kind of clustered over here and also it is scalable to five nanometer technology node and beyond. So that's the reason why we believe carbon nanotube transistor is one of the most promising technology that can keep us going further along the path of more slow scaling in all the more and more approach as what we call in the industry. However, up to this point, we just talk about device physics, mature science. It's like the science muses on, 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 on Mount Helicon are saying to us, this is what you should do to solve this problem. But Hephaestus, our engineering god, 
fallen from Olympus is saying, wait a minute, this material is impossible to work with. That's the same question from most people when they think about carbon nanotubes. So our current way of making silicon devices is like building a statue by a sculptor. Right? You start from a, a solid block of marble and then you chip away with your chisel. But for building our nanotube devices, it's like the opposite way. You start from a pile of dust, and then first you select millions of particles with the color you want, and then you glue them together to form a statue. You probably never met a sculptor building the statue this way, but this is our challenge as we supposedly building something new and better. So the first uh, question is, you know, how we select out the particles we need from that pile of dust. And for carbon nanotubes, it means to sort out high purity semiconducting nanotubes out of their mixture with metallic nanotubes from this pile of dust coming out from the reaction chamber. And for people not that familiar with carbon nanotubes, depending on which, which direction you fold the graphene film to make the carbon nanotube, they could be either a semiconductor with a band gap or a metal. And if you want to build transistors, you need to get rid of virtually all metallic nanotubes, otherwise they were short of devices. But thanks to the development of chemistry, and now we actually have many different ways to do it successfully. And here is just one example. We can rely on the oxidation of nanotubes by oxygen dissolving water. Because for this charge transfer reaction to take place, there must be overlap between occupied states of the nanotubes and unoccupied states of oxygen. But the nice thing about oxygen dissolving water is their energy level can be precisely tuned by the pH. So at a given optimized pH, we can make this reaction only takes place for metallic nanotubes, but at a much slower rate for semiconducting nanotubes due to the presence of their band gap. And then the more oxidized the metallic nanotubes are gonna bear positive surface charge, which can then be sorted out using high throughput chromatography method. And at IBM, we have the capability to el electrically characterize the purity of sorted semiconducting nanotubes by just the making and measuring thousands of transistors built on individual nanotubes. So here you can see without the separation, many devices we made actually connected by metallic nanotubes and their conductance cannot be modulated by the gate electric field. But with the sorted nanotube, almost all devices we made are connected by semiconducting nanotubes. And actually, only two devices possibly connected by metallic nanotubes were identified out of over 3,000 transistors we measured, giving a lower bound for the purity of the semiconducting nanotubes to be above 99.94%, a number that has already been improved to 99.999% with additional engineering optimizations at IBM. So the next question is how are we gonna glue these particles into statues? And for carbon nanotubes, it means to assemble these sorted semiconducting nanotubes which are flexible and often entangled with each other as spaghetti into this rigid, well-ordered line arrays with fixed nanotube pitch. One possible way to accomplish this target is to rely on external forces, such as the electric field. And in this example, we can generate this well-ordered line arrays of semiconducting nanotubes using the alternating fringing electric field between this assembly electrode and the global silicon substrate. And a very nice feature about this method is the nanotube pitch is very uniform because it's kind of self-limited. Right, the deposition of one nanotube is gonna effectively screen the fringing field around it, leading to a kind of self-limited nanotube density or pitch at around uh, 20 nanometer, as can be observed in both experiment and also finite element simulation. Transistors built on such semiconducting nanotube arrays demonstrate good performance with off ratio uh, approaching 1,000 and the on-state current density above 40 microampere per micron, which is decent. But still, 
about an order of magnitude or more less than current silicon transistors due to the nanotube density limited to only 15 nanotubes per micron. So a better approach is probably to let the statue build itself, which means to form this aligned arrays of nanotubes based on self-assembly. One example is this langmuir Schaefer assembly method. So here, sorted high-purity semiconducting nanotubes are first suspended in an organic solvent and then dispersed on top of a water surface. And due to surface tension, it is spread out to cover the whole water surface. Uh, and then after the organic solvent evaporates, this randomly placed nanotube can then be pushed together to form well-ordered aligned arrays with the nanotube pitch kind of self-limited by the nanotube diameter. And this assembled nanotube film can then be vertically transferred to substrate suitable for device fabrication. The assembled and transferred nanotube film demonstrates good uniformity over large area. And since the nanotube pitch is uh, kind of self-limited by the nanotube diameter, uh, this nanotube aligned arrays kind of fully cover your wafer surface with density above 500 nanotubes per micron as characterized by both top view and cross-sectional GEM. The good alignment quality is also confirmed optically with polarized Raman spectroscopy. And so the, the nanotube Raman signal will be greatly reduced if the polarization direction of your incident laser is perpendicular to the nanotube alignment direction. It also reflected in this uh, uh, unprecedented high quality factor for surface path on resonator made on, on uh, aligned arrays uh, of carbon nanotubes in this case. Their electrical properties are characterized by simply integrating them into active transistors. And their on-state current is improved to about 125 microampere per micron, which is a significant improvement over 40 microampere per micron we got for low density nanotube arrays. But far less than what we expected based on the nanotube density. So we were very disappointed at that time. But then we realized this performance is actually limited by the contact resistance as evident from this super linear uh, current voltage characteristics of our transistors. And this high contact resistance is likely caused by the sharply reduction of co available contact area for each nanotube inside the array when we go from a, a low density nanotube arrays to this kind of full surface coverage, high density aligned arrays with conventional palladium side bonding contact. And if that's the case, the performance is expected to be significantly improved with the adoption of n bonding contact whose, uh, whose contact resistance is independent of contact area. And then we went ahead to construct a nanotube transistor based on such high density semiconducting nanotube arrays with n bonding contact. And the overall device footprint is also extremely scaled to only 40 nanometer, similar as what we did for individual nanotube transistors. And indeed, uh, this device demonstrates about 10 times performance improvement with on currents above 1.2 milliampere per micron. Uh, but the bigger question, the more important question is how it is compared to our other options, especially the most advanced uh, silicon thin fat and nanoware transistor, each with the smallest uh, 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 fil silicon film thickness uh, for competing at the five nanometer technology node. And uh, under the same gate overdrive, which is defined as like how much voltage you applied above the threshold voltage, our nanotube transistor demonstrates similar on-state current, but under at least two times lower soft string bias. So this is the first time for the on-state conductance of nanotube array transistor to outperform that of best competing silicon transistors without any normalization, an important milestone in the development of nanotube transistor technology. So as an answer to Hephaestus' question, it is possible to build a statue from a pair of dust based on clever chemistry, self-assembly, and better device engineering efforts.
there are still many challenges ahead, but I hope our results can give you some confidence about the future of this technology. But more important is to motivate you enough so that you can join, join with us, as well as our colleagues at MIT, Stanford, Wisconsin, and, pa and Peking University on this what we call resurgence of nanotube electronics. And we can work together to solve the remaining problems. So what is the biggest next problem down the road? Well, you get some clue from the transfer curve of the array transistor we just uh, described. Despite its excellent on-site performance, this device has a horrible subthreshold swing, above 500 millivolts per decade. Why this is so bad for the nanotube array transistor? And this is a collection of individual nanotube transistors. You can see most of them demonstrate sharp subthreshold swing, 100 to 200 millivolts per decade at most, but also a very wide variation of threshold voltage with a range up to three volts. Why this is so bad? So when you pack these uh, individual nanotubes into, into a line or arrays, you will find, you know, the way we do it is uh, basically randomly select you know, 50 curves out of this collection and then add them up. And then you will find the subthreshold swing of this hyperstatic array transistor is also limited to only 500 millivolts per decade because each nanotube is turned on sequentially with the increase of gate bias. So the first challenge is very clear, right? Why for individual nanotubes, the threshold voltage variability is so bad? Well, simple answer to this question is because it's a single molecule, right? They can change their conductance with the presence of virtually anything. That's the reason why many people use that as uh, good sensors. But that's a big problem for them to be used as transistors, where we want billions of them to stay the same. So we need to pinpoint the exact source dominating such variability as a critical first step to keep it under control using rational approach. It is also a very interesting and challenging scientific question, as well as a mystery in literature with so many things going on in our nanotube transistors. So part of that could come from the diameter distribution of our nanotube source. Our nanotube source, although high in semiconducting spaces, are not monodispersed. And the diameter is related with band gap, and therefore the threshold voltage. However, this contribution, according to calculation, is much smaller than the overall variability we observed in experiment. It's also not come from the process variation which has long correlation distance. Because even if you make two devices on the same nanotube and residing right next to each other, there's, there's still demonstrate fairly large threshold voltage difference up to a volt with uh, the variability as, as large as that between randomly selecting two devices from the same group. It's not from the traps causing device hysteresis as even all the traps are frozen under 20K to virtually eliminate the device hysteresis, the threshold voltage standard deviation is only barely improved. So it's most likely come from the randomness of fixed charges. But these fixed charges could locate either predominantly on the surface of nanotubes as dopants or uniformly at the uh, oxide air interface and we need to know which one is the actual devil. So here we did a combination of experiment and simulation study. And in experiment, we built a race of single nanotube transistors with their silicon dioxide gate dielectric thickness varied all the way from two to 15 nanometer. And then we measure the scaling of their average threshold voltage and its standard deviation. And in simulation, we build a relatively simple simulation tool for our nanotube transistors. It has a, a planar uh, a global backgate, varied gate oxide thickness, a 100 nanometer long nanotube channel, and this fixed charges distribute either randomly on the surface of nanotubes, or as in this case, at the oxide air interface. So this is a Monte Carlo simulation tool. So for each case, we generate at least the 300 different random charge distribution, and then calculate the threshold voltage statistics. And for each distribution, the first step 
is to calculate the potential profile along the axis of the nanotube to generate the spine diagram. It has this peaks and valleys due to the perturbation from this fixed charges. And then we calculate the transmission probability, which is 100% above the conjunction bind or below the valence bind. But within the band gap, it's going to have certain probability across each barrier, which can be calculated using the WKB approximation. So here the B is the carbon bound length, we pi is the tight bending parameter, EJ is the band gap, and then this ZS and ZF is the starting and ending point of each barrier. And then we can add them together to get the overall transmission probability across the whole channel, which can be easily converted to a simulated IV characteristic for threshold voltage extraction using the standard Landau formula. So here is a comparison between the experiment and simulation. Now if you assume this fixed charge only distribute on the surface of nanotubes as dopants, then even under an extremely high doping concentration, like one dopant per thousand carbon atoms, which kind of enough to degeneratively dope your nanotube, your semiconducting nanotube, their random variation is insufficient to account for the change of either average weighty or its standard deviation as a function of gate oxide thickness. However, if you assume this fixed charge distributes relatively uniformly at the oxide air interface, then with a surface charge density of 10 to the minus 7 coulomb per centimeter square, a value comparable to the number extracted in experiment for processed silicon dioxide surface using electrostatic force microscopy, you will find the simulation and experiment agree fairly well with each other. We see a little bit larger variation in experiment. And that partially because uh, the simplified space fading dielectric in our simulation where we use the silicon dioxide rather than air as in the experiment. So based on this result, we draw the conclusion that this is Uh, this one is the average weight. This is a standard deviation. They're all as a function of gate oxide thickness. Yeah, so based on this, conclu uh, th this, uh, this experimental and simulation comparison, we draw the conclusion like this large weight variation of our current single tube transistor is actually dominated by the randomness of fixed charges at the oxide air interface rather than anything intrinsic to the nanotube. So the next interesting engineering question is how are we going to be able to keep it under control, right? Some possible ways is better surface path elevation. Charges are distributed in the insulator or is, or is the model uh, only pulling them out from one or the other surface? Uh, you mean like embedded within the, within the gate dielectric? Well, where are the charges that you consider? charges at the nanotube surface or at the opposite surface of the insulator? Uh, I, I, I yeah, yeah. Where the charges are. So you're talking about whether the yeah. charge is, uh, is on this surface or on this surface. Or are they distributed? I mean, I, I, you, you talked about two models yeah. in many cases. Are those, where, where are the charges? Yeah, yeah, we consider that. That's the that's reason why in the experimental part we did this this gate uh, this gate dielectric thickness scaling study, right? So 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 if the charge distributes either on this surface, on this surface, or uniformly within the oxide, they're gonna have different scaling behavior with your gate oxide thickness. And what we say in the experiments agree with this charge mainly on the surface, on the top surface of the oxide which kind of makes sense because this top surface in our current devices is not passivated. It's just directly in contact with air. Okay, so you, you show us the model where the charges are quite distributed uniformly, but that doesn't work. Right, it doesn't work. It does not agree with, uh, with, the, with the experiment. Well, a question related to that. Are the charges spatially, uh, did you look at different locations? Is there a way you could look at where those charges are? Or Uh, that's a very good question. So say there are some local non-uniformity. So let's kind of uh, uh, come back to this experiment, right? Whether it's, uh, it's related with process variation, right? So if you have a 
a chunks of charge over, over there, then you, you should have like correlation, relatively long correlation distance, which means if you make two devices next to each other, they should have similar threshold voltage. And, and we, don't, we, don't, we don't really see that. Uh, yes, but uh, most of these devices is very thin gate dielectric, right? So you think about their screening lines, which is um, about the same as your gate dielectric thickness, it's also gonna be small. I mean, that's, 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 that's possible, you'll have some variation, right. but simple, simple model is just treated, treated uniform and it agree well with the experiment. So I think that's a, that's a good, good starting point, right? Um, so another, another possible way like uh, 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 to, to keep it under control could be this gate all around structure, you know, not for the purpose of better electrostatics, but just to electrically shield the effect of these straight charges. So you probably have better idea, of why not you know, jump into this field again, and I think we have great collaboration opportunities. Uh, so finally, I will briefly touch on the billion dollar question, right? What will be the future of this technology when will we have uh, you know, multiple times faster CPU uh, based on carbon nanotubes? So I don't have the answer yet, because here we're talking about uh, shaking up a $300 billion business and even the foundation of our current economy. And I'm not Sarah, man, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, but we probably can peek into the future uh, through looking back at the history. And this time we look at the history of liquid crystal displays. So liquid crystal display was invented in the central laboratory of RCA, Radio Corporation of America, uh, in 1960s by Richard Williams and George Hillmeyer. And in 1968, RCA announced its plan to develop this uh, prototype into flat panel television, which is now a $100 billion business in a high profile press conference in New York City. So at that time, everything looked perfect for RCA, right? They had the right technology, they had the right vision. But such combination did not produce commercial success. And RCA closed its LCD department in 1976. So how did LCD find its way to become a technology that really changed our world? It started with Japanese company. They are not that visionary compared to RCA. So they started with something small and simple the display for portable calculator, a very small niche market. And this is Sharp EL805, the first LCD pocket calculator to the market in 1973. Of course, it's low resolution, low contrast, uh, never gonna be used in a TV. But it was actually a critical first step. It brought this technology to the market so that it can generate profit for further research and development but more importantly, it has helped us to acquire knowledge about how to do mass production of LCD panels. So soon in 1987, Sharp introduced the first 14 inch color LCD panel, which was then used in this classical IBM ThinkPad 700, the first killer application for liquid crystal displays. And then soon the first large size flat panel televisions in 1997. So come back to carbon nanotubes. I think we have the right technology and granulation, which I believe is correct, based on the unique properties of carbon nanotubes. But what we really need right now is to bring this material to the market as soon as possible, probably starting from some niche market, like transparent electronics or flexible electronics, based on the technology we developed for carbon nanotubes along the pathway. And I think this time, Chinese companies are ahead of us. Foxconn is shaping out this nanotube-based transparent flexible touch screen. And another Chinese startup company is making this earphones, wireless earphones, based on carbon nanotube thin film right now. So US companies need to act promotely if they want to catch up. Otherwise, it's gonna be too late, as in the LCD industry. And I hope this new electronics resurgence initiative from DARPA could help. But more importantly, it is our researchers who are also entrepreneurs need to act promotely. 
So that's all I would like to share with you about our current research at IBM on carbon nanotube transistor technology. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my colleagues and collaborators working on this nanotube project, and thank you all for your attention. questions. Uh, in your analysis, you just assume that the carbon nanotube is perfect in all the cases. What if, because of the synthesis techniques, it could be, because it, you need to have the right SP2 hybridization and yes. things like that. Yes. What if it, that were not the case, that could explain some of the variations because carbon has a way of mixing things up. Yes, yes, that's a very good question, right? So, so why we don't care other things? Because other things are probably not that important. Uh, uh, in, in, in the final day, this, this, this thing gonna be important. This, and think about the defect density. Um, our carbon nano, our device is very small. The channel lines is, uh, in, this, in, in all this experiment, is at most like 100 nanometer, right? So the, the possibility you have a defect over there is also got reduced in certain sense. Um, and, and more importantly, it's just this simple fixed charge on the surface, which is very reasonable, and we see it directly from the electrostatic force microscopy, is enough to explain a large fraction of the variability we see in the experiment. So the first step is just get this problem solved, right? Then we're gonna move, 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 uh, move forward. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we are far from, uh, from, uh, from success in, in, in that aspect, yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it's not a secret. I mean, there are actually so many different ways to, 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 to do that. And it all started with uh, uh, McCurson's work in Northwestern. So they, they, they put different kind of surfactants wrap around the nanotubes and, uh, and then they do this centrifugation. And uh, their idea is, uh, well, not their idea, but what, what they say is uh, with certain surfactant, it's easier for the semiconducting nanotubes to form bundles. Uh, and then, and then they're gonna have different density, right? So you can you can separate out you know, using centrifugation method. There are also other approach uh, in in both Japan and, and Stanford and in Unreal, where people just uh, uh, synthesize uh, uh, different uh, different surfactant, and the certain structure of the surfactant uh, have special affinity to to semiconducting nanotubes. Um, and then what you do is you just uh, take the surfactant, you mix that with uh, uh, with nanotubes, you do sonication, then you, you only suspend uh, the, the, the semiconducting nanotubes. Uh, and in, in our case, uh, um, uh, it's, a, it, it's like you're, you're, you control the pH and then you pass it through a standard uh, chromatography column. And then you, you, because the, the interaction, because they have different surface charge, so their interaction is different, their, their retention time is different, then you're gonna uh, get different Kind of nanotubes at different times, so it's, it's it's all pretty straightforward. The reason why I just dis, dis, described this method is we kind of have a better understanding about the, about the, about the mechanism, right? It's, it's kind of very straightforward uh, mechanism compared to this kind of selective bending or ultra centrifugation, which uh, is hard to explain in a relatively short time, like why it works. <laughs> yeah, you can buy solutions now. It's a it's a.
this is you can nicely show that all this can be very control of the variability and so on. But uh, practically, how many of the transistors we can make kind of as a kind of entire circuits? Uh, well, this uh, the the yield. Okay, just uh, so you talk about transistor yield or circuit yield, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, can build up in terms of the system system levels. Uh, so, so transistor is relatively easy. I mean, they can always make the transistor work. The question is how well they work. <laughs> uh, uh, so you're, you're going to have a threshold voltage distribution. You have the, the sub-threshold swing distribution, on-current distribution. But on the other hand, uh, I mean, put all these things together, right? Uh, we, can, we can make circuits. We can make ring oscillators. And, and this year, we published our work uh, uh, about a five-stage ring oscillator based on this nanotube array transistors. And uh, 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 so five-stage ring oscillator have about 11 transistors. And uh, you need to, their threshold voltage to match with each other. And also it's the same OS transistor, so even more complicated than just the PFAT. Uh, uh, the frequency we got is the several hundred megahertz. Uh, and the, 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 the circuit yield in that aspect is about 15%, which is not too bad. You're talking about the diameter distribution. Mm -hmm. and what about the length? How much control do you need or do you have over the length of these tubes? This, when you say a 40 nanometer footprint, you aren't, you aren't using a one micron long tube, right? are you? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, right? So, so we, we, we didn't talk too much about the, 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 the length control. Uh, we, we don't have too much efforts at IBM on control of the length because com compared with the separating based on their electronic type, Controlling the length is actually relatively easier, uh, and uh, uh, especially based on the chromatography method, right? When you have a um, what they call like size exclusion chromatography, so if you have a longer nanotube, then it takes more time for them to travel through all these like small holes or pathways. So it's it's a relatively easier compared to electronic type. And our colleague at NIST, um, their target is just to get whatever the purest material for whatever time whatever type. So they spend a uh, 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 lot of time on, on trying to get not only just a you know, single electronic type, but also single chirality and also the single length of the nanotube. So it is doable. But come back to the, to the problem, like why we didn't spend too much time on this is uh, because our device is so small, right? We make 40 nanometer footprint and our, our nanotube length on average is several hundred nanometer. So, so it's, it's, a, it's not a big deal. <laughs> Even when we make a ray transistors, most likely it's going to be have one nanotube directly connect our source string electrodes. Yeah, so it's more from filtration and separation rather than growth. No, it's not from really growth. Uh, gr no, no, it's, it's it's from the sonication. It's it's cut down the nanotube. Yeah. Okay. Question. Yeah. Um, you okay. Uh, how precisely you can control the um, distance between the um, so, so, so here we talk about this Langmuir uh, Blodgett method, right? So it's kind of self-limited uh, self by the diameter of the nanotube because you push them together to form a line of rays. Uh, we, we have another approach where, um, which I didn't have enough time to cover, is based on the surface chemistry. Um, so what we do is you take a wafer, you prefab some trench structure on that, and then you do selective functionalization of the bottom of your trench, and you just put your nanotube over there. Uh, uh, the benefit for that method is uh, it's, uh, it's easier to scale up to you know, eight-inch wafers, for example. Uh, for, for, for that one, uh, we, we can, now we can do the, the pitch down to about, uh, about 30, 20 to 30 nanometer, where this trench is made by uh, uh, the dye block called polymer self-assembly. Um, so how they come together and there is a shortcut or some tunneling uh, effects happening. So I just uh, we don't say too much problem. I mean, that's the kind of interesting <laughs> conversation I also had today. Uh, um, so carbon nanotubes, uh, we generally believe like carbon nanotube is a very strongly quantum confined system. So, so even when the two nanotubes are very close to each other, we don't say they, they interfere with each other. We don't. Are 
were talking about. So this might affect them if there is a connection between the carbon nanotube with these extra charges, uh, which is located at the surface, and this might cause some. I I don't quite quite sure. So so you're you're talking about so so but basically our device is just the one nanotube directly connect from soft string. There is no, we hope there is no carrier transfer from one nanotube to another nanotube and then to the to the contact. Um, so you just think about it that way and then when you have fixed charges, it's just gonna affect all these nanotubes over there. It depends on where they are located. Right, right, right. So so when you have a so when you have two 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 nanotubes over here, you have a fixed charge over there, they have different impact. So this two two nanotubes are gonna have different threshold voltage. That's exactly what we are talking about. Between the nanotubes, this fixed charges, then how does it? Yeah, this is all, all different possibilities. This is what we call like random variation, right? You, you don't know where the fixed charge is. You just know roughly their, their, their densi density over large area. And this random variation. <laughs> so do you also envision that the transistor will come from one nanotube or you will use it with uh, an array of nanotubes? Uh, well, it depends on application, right? So, so for, for, for logic, we, we, we did a simulation for, for, the, for the chip performance, and uh, in that case, it's kind of automatic running the, the optimization uh, uh, for, for how many nanotubes we want for each, uh, for each transistor. And we got a number about like six to 10 nanotubes per device for the logic application. But of course, for some other. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I don't know the, the exact details, but uh, you also got some constraints about uh, the scaling, right? You do not just to scale the device gate length, you also scale the device width. Uh, um, so we got, the number we got is about six to 10 nanotubes per device. Um, but for other applications, I mean, where you don't need enough very high like drive current, you might well enough to use just the one nanotube for scaling purpose. So I, I get multiple uh, parallel nanotubes with sequence from graphene, uh, but if you make a graphene transistor, small enough, uh, how would their performance, graphene doesn't come, doesn't have the bandwidth, so I, I can't get, so that's the primary difference, I guess. Right, exactly, so if you use a uniform graphene, you cannot turn it off, right, it cannot be a transistor. And then if you make the, the become a very small trenches, you, you basically get a very crappy nanotube, right? So there's a lot of, uh, lots of uh, like edge defects, scattering centers, then why not just use a perfect nanotube, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you question about your carbon nanotube computers, is this something like a CMOS-like or just carbon nanotube just with the CMOS circuits? Uh, our target is to make it CMOS-like. So here we only talk about PFAT. And uh, carbon nanotube is a very interesting material. It's almost like an intrinsic semiconductor. So you can, you can, you can achieve both P-type and N-type based on what kind of uh, uh, contact you put on the nanotube. If you put really low work function metal as contact to the nanotube, then you've got a pretty nice NSAT, uh, some metals like, uh, like yttrium or, or scandium. And, and, and that's, that's how we made our CMOS string oscillator. But the problem for this low work function metal is that they have stability issue, right? <laughs> Even if you, you passive it, it is gonna easily be oxidized in air like over time. Uh, so that's the difficult part. And so we're still working on that. But the target is to make like purely carbon nanotube CMOS. So why don't we thank our speaker?